Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 13, Episode 140. He's Dave Bryan. I'm Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being back with us here this Wednesday, Steelers Nation. Dave, as we chug along during Steelers OTAs, their, I guess, final day of OTAs will come tomorrow on Thursday. Then they have their three-day mandatory mini camp the following week. Got some roster moves, a bit of news to talk about today. So how you doing, Dave? Uh, doing better than the Pirates were doing <laughs> yesterday. Uh, man, how, you losing to a team like the A's, I just looked to it. looks like they got an early game today. I guess it's a get-out-of-town day uh, for for the A's there. So uh, hopefully the Pirates can rebound. But, uh, yeah, here we are, hump day, uh, third week of OTAs, and got a little bit of news to discuss and a couple of quotes to go over and – some numbers to uh, kind of throw around uh, during this show. So we ought to be able to get about an hour's worth of content out of today. All right. So let's dive on in. Dave, the Steelers are finally at their max 90 man roster after sitting, sitting at 89 for a couple of weeks. They made a, a several moves in order to actually get to 90. They released a rookie wide receiver, Cody Crest, who was uh, or Trest, I believe is the pronunciation of the last name there who was briefly on this team's roster and in his place with then two spots open, the team sign running back Darius Hagens and the offensive tackle uh, was a Jared Williams, a former Philadelphia Eagle. And so it's Hagens and Williams being number 89 and number 90 on this roster. Yeah. Cody trust. We, uh, we, we hardly, hardly knew you, uh, and, and mentioned when he was signed, we'll see how long he lasts. Well, it ended up not being long. I would imagine maybe that might be, might've been related. I think, uh, Anthony Miller might've been dealing with something. And then obviously, uh, we got, uh, Alan Robinson looked like he's starting to do a little bit more, more, more stuff, uh, in practices there at, uh, OTA. So, you know, that might've been, uh, an addition that was health related and uh, makes you kind of wonder with another running back out of the blue like this, maybe if that might be health related and uh, who knows tackle as well too. So whenever you get these guys, especially guys with not a lot of experience uh, getting added to the bottom of the roster at this time of year, you know, uh, it makes you kind of wonder how, how, how long they might be around. And look, I mean, yeah, uh, from, Obviously, from this point forward on into uh, the you know start of training camp and really throughout training camp and the preseason, going to be some churning at the bottom end of the roster. So we'll have to see, you know, uh, how much of that takes place moving forward. So I think you looked a little bit at uh, 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 Hagen's right and, and broke down his tape, and I know Jonathan Hightrader looked at uh, the new tackle as well too. Uh, what do you have to pass along on Hagens? He's an interesting guy. Um, Virginia State kid, uh, originally committed to Alderson Broadus, which I believe is in West Virginia. It's not PSAC, but it's kind of in that neck of the woods um, from my standpoint when I grew up and went to college. And then he transferred to Virginia State, rushed for over a thousand yards last year. Look at him from a measurable perspective. I mean, it's it's attractive just off off the, the the page at you he's almost six foot 207 ran a four four eight put up 26 reps on the bar 36 and a half inch vertical his ras score is 939 and so yeah. that just on the surface is pretty intriguing you watch the tape and obviously there's a competition element to to put that into context but you see power you see physicality and finish you see open field speed some change of direction does have a tendency to run a bit tall and try to bounce too many runs to the outside. Won't get away with that at the NFL level, but a guy that was pretty well-rounded can help it on special teams. I think he has 13 career tackles. And so he's a guy that, you know, can be, I think an asset on, on the coverage side of things. So, you know, I think with running back being pretty thin right now, and I think that's the reason why they added to that position because there really isn't a lot of bodies on the roster right now. Obviously the only two guys that are guaranteed anything are, 
Najee Harris and Jalen Warren. And, and beyond that, it's kind of a, a hodgepodge of Jason Huntley, Anthony McFarland, the biggest name beyond the top two, Alfonso Graham, the rookie tryout addition, and now Darius Hagans. But he's a guy that I think has real talent to, to keep an eye on. Who is he? He was with the, the Colts, right? Correct. Yeah, he Originally. had gotten... Which so, so was stress. So it's a lot of right. Colts, Col- Colts and Eagles is kind of been the theme, the, the, the funnel of the Steelers season, it feels like. But yeah, uh, he was uh, there, then got waived. Another HBCU, right? Yeah, he was at the HBCU Combine, which, of course, uh, Omar Khan attended, where Hagens ran that 448. And so you've seen a couple of those HBCU guys make their way to Pittsburgh. All right. And about Williams, uh, obviously, the Eagles connection there is probably the most, you know, probably the, the, the most notable thing. Uh, I think he didn't he bounce on and off of practice squads. I think uh, what the Eagles and maybe the Lions, I think uh, there uh, a, a fairly nice athletic profile on him and some long arms, man. If there's if there's a thing that we've uh, 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 kind of reconfirmed uh, this past offseason. Uh, and obviously it's been a while, you know, this, the Steelers haven't drafted a whole lot of tackles over the years, but, uh, it, it looks like, you know, they're going to, uh, moving forward, going to have to check that box, um, more times than not when it comes to the long arms. Yeah. He's what 35 and seven, seven eighths inches. And so, you know, they've certainly want size. They want length. I know Jonathan did the report. The tape doesn't seem to match up. Maybe the tantalizing size that Williams has seems to be pretty raw overall. But again, I think tackle, I think David O said he had counted up how many offensive linemen in total were on the 90 man. And I think he's only at 14. So they still feel maybe at least one short, Mm. but some of that is also probably just adding some of the right pieces and numbers and, probably still a little weak at tackle. They were kind of sitting in that four to five, I think ish type of range there, depending on, you know, where Spencer Anderson plays and they'll probably move around. So adding some tackles just to have some 13 type of guys, you know, somebody gets hurt and needs a day, that type of stuff's important and kind of how you construct your off season roster. All right. We'll see how long those guys stick now. And they are at 90 uh, for, for the first time now. Yeah, but not that it means a whole lot, and I'll nerd out on my special teams thing for a second, but they brought in all those long snappers and didn't sign anybody. Do you think that was they had a real interest in in signing somebody and just didn't find a guy, or they just want to have kind of rule decks names to turn to if something happened to Kuntz, you know, let's say, midway through camp or something? Yeah, it, it, it very well could be that as well, too. So, I mean, we'll, 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 I mean, look, here's the thing about Kuntz, right? I mean, it's not like he's uh, was, was borderline, uh, all pro pro bowl. (laughs) Right. So, uh, if they get an opportunity to upgrade the position or bring in some, probably some legitimate, uh, uh, you know, pressure on him, they might do it. So, you know, it's hard to know intentions for sure, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, something like a long snapper position, but this very well could be, Hey, we need to, you know, uh, we only have one on the roster and what happens if, you know, he pulls something or, or, or whatever, you know, we, we need to guy you know, someone we can call right away that, that we know can at least come in and get some practice snaps in. Yeah, that's a fair point by you. So we'll pivot now to what's happening at OTAs on Monday. I always forget there is that kind of quote unquote Monday practice, but like you said, they always seem to take that off and go do something fun. So they were doing some go-karting and then of course, back on the practice field Tuesday, today and Thursday, Larry Ogunjobi speaking to the media after Tuesday's practice, discussing some of the reasons why he resigned in Pittsburgh, putting down roots. He really liked the way the team treated him with his foot injury last year, taking things slow, not rushing him says, hopefully he'll be healthy. And those injuries last year throughout the fall and the winter, really nagged at him and, and and were pretty, I think, quote, annoying was the word that he used, but also had good things to say about Keanu Benton, called him a dancing bear, which I don't think Benton was aware of that comment and what that means, but that is a compliment to give a fellow defensive lineman. Yeah, look, I think it was pretty reveal. You know, uh, uh, Joby had some pretty revealing things to say, you know, during that media session and talked about how he didn't, he wasn't able to even start running again until what, uh, uh, was it June or July? One, one of the two. Uh, and then, you know, just he, he wasn't in his normal cycle. And I think obviously, uh, that, that, you know, he had, what was it? A knee issue that, that bounced on and off the injury report last year. 
It was everything. It was knee, groin, I think ankle. I mean, he was playing a game of operation last year. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and, and, you know, wasn't able to get in a, a, a solid routine. It sounded like, and look, uh, without a doubt, uh, his play wasn't where everyone hoped it would be, especially from a statistical standpoint, coming off the, you know, the, the, the great season he had, uh, the season before that. And, you know, the team obviously did go out and re-sign him to a longer term, uh, deal, you know, uh, earlier uh, this off season with him being scheduled to be a, a unrestricted free agent, you know, through a you know pretty substantial amount of money out of, I, you know, I, once again, I was, I was really surprised that, uh, all of that got done, uh, with him. And, and now that he is locked up, uh, and hopefully back healthy again, which it sounds like he is, uh, hopefully this team can get, the kind of season out of him that he had two seasons ago. And if they do, uh, boy, that would be a huge, huge boom. And, uh, you know, I, you, you know, you probably won't, won't have to rotate him as much. You wouldn't, you wouldn't think. And, you know, he's another great, you know, older presence in that locker room and can help with some of those younger guys specifically, uh, Benton there. So, this is going to be a huge season for Larry Ogan Joby, right? Because what happens if you get the kind of, you know, season that you got out of him last year out of uh, after signing him to that deal that you signed him to? Yeah, um, it is a big year for him. And I think we were both a little surprised at, at the, the amount of money in the contract, the length of the contract. But like you said, there are some avenues for Pittsburgh to get out of it if, if Ogan Joby does not play up to standard. So hopefully the issue last year was just him coming off the foot injury, not working in the spring, not getting signed till June, a bit limited in training camp and then dealing with all those nagging things. My concern is just those things are going to continue as he gets older. The things that typically don't start going away as you get closer to 30, they start adding and compounding on, on top of each other. So it's a big season for him. I think he certainly flashed last year. I mean, I think, I think his season was up and down. There were some great plays. I still remember that one play against Atlanta, just taking that center five yards in the backfield, shedding him and making the tackle. I mean, he legitimately had some really impressive snaps, but he was, to me, a pretty inconsistent dude in both run defense, even pass rush, only one and a half sacks. And uh, the pressures were better than what the sack number indicates, but he's got to be able to finish these plays a bit more. It just felt like a very up and down year for Ogan Joby. What happens if he misses time? In 2023, in terms of his future, or in terms of what Pittsburgh, who uh, Pittsburgh yeah, turns I mean, to? I mean, just in the you know, who, who you know, what does it look like? I mean, you know, in 2023, yeah, it's a fair question. Hopefully, Keanu Benton develops and can offer something in in nickel and sub packages. I think, although he's been mostly a more interior guy throughout his career, um, Armand Watts, I think, is somebody that can can play that role. I think he's got some some versatility. You know, Isaiah Loudemoke, I think he's a bubble guy. You know, again, what is to Marvin Leal? We'll ask that question again. I, I would say, I would say at least in base defense, there aren't, there isn't a tremendous amount of depth in terms of their base ends, um, unless Chris Wormley were to come back. And we don't know what that ACL is doing. It's probably still got, you know, a, a lot of recovery to, to have happened there. So I, I think it's a fair question by you. Sounds like Leal's closer to 300. And man, if that's what, Close to 300 looks like I'm going to start eating again. <laughs> <laughs> right. If he's close to 300, I'm close to 400. I mean, but I, I mean, he, 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 well. uh, he does. Uh, that's what yeah. I'm getting at. I mean, uh, to look at him and look, it's, it's so uh, it's always been a struggle for me to kind of judge, judge that uh, guys in and out of pads, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing there. But, you know, even throughout uh, the early stages of, 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 uh, uh, OTAs and, and just, you know, pictures of him, you know, on the internet, you know, from, from this off season, I, it didn't look like he was close to 300 pounds, but apparently that's, that's where he's at, you know, 290 something, whatever. Uh, that, that's a, that's a leap that he looks lean. <laughs> I'll tell you that, uh, at, you know, if that, that is indeed his weight, there's no reason to think that it's not, I mean, yeah. Uh, if he looks like that, man, looks like he could put on another 10 pounds, you know, mm-hmm. uh, something like that. But, uh, uh, with him being close to that weight, you'd have to think, you know, most definitely going to be 
you know, moving forward, hand in the dirt uh, predominantly with him. You would think. I mean, I've seen clips of him working with a D lineman and the edge guys, and that was, I think, pre Marcus Golden signing. And obviously, Golden's addition would logically tell you Liao would play more of an interior hand down type of role. But we'll see. I mean, the team has said all offseason they like his versatility. You know, I still have reservations about how effective he can be as say a base defensive end. I think he can work well as a sub packets pass uh, pass rusher and you know third down and to half and the game type stuff. Um, but it's something obviously I'll be watching very closely when I head out the training camp, which is coming up pretty soon in about six, seven weeks. Now, obviously, we expect Benton to start off inside there. And, you know, the progress with him uh, probably going to be more atypical when it comes to to rookie uh, uh, defensive lineman there. Uh, so with that, you know, how, how big of keys are guys like Ogan Joby and Leal when it comes to that defensive line? Yeah, I think pretty big. I mean, obviously, Okunjobi is a starter, as a 800 plus snap kind of guy. You better get that that production, that consistency out of him and Leal. If you can get some depth and a guy that might be able to have some versatility for you and somebody that can really, especially rush the passer too. Because in terms of like who are your pass rushing defense alignment, it's Hayward, it's Okunjobi. You know, I think Benton can do some of that. And then after that, it's kind of hard to find who those guys are. I mean, I think Watts can a little bit, but he's never really been a sub package player in his career. I think he can rush out of base, but, you know, on, on third and seven, I don't think he's going to see a lot of action. When it comes to the defense overall, is the, is the defensive line one of the biggest questions uh, or is it more inside linebacker? Yeah, I mean, there are some questions along the D-line in terms of just depth, and I think the starters look solid in terms of if Ogunjobi can stay healthy, it's him. I mean, I'll assume Benton as a starting nose tackle and Hayward. I, I'm good with that. I think the concerns are a bit of inside linebacker, slot corner. Of course, we talked about it a lot, and I just you know mentioned this on the podcast, wrote about it yesterday, the newness, those hubs of communication and the growing pains that may come along with that. That's kind of where my concerns lie. But I think depth defensive line-wise, there are some questions there. Uh, going back to the Ogan Joby uh, interview, I mean, my, my takeaway overall was, you know, I, I feel a lot, you know, feeling better about it overall. Just, you know, to hear the words come out of his mouth that he just, he wasn't really where he needed to be and, and obviously got a late start last off season. So uh, from, from just a taking his words in, 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 in context, uh, I felt better than I did yesterday morning about it, you know. And I think there's real value in being able to put down roots, which is what he said, being able to stay in one place. And I understand contracts, you know, they're only worth the, the paper they're printed on, if that. But he he's bounced around a lot. He finished up his last year in Cleveland, then goes to Cincinnati, then almost signed with Chicago. That falls through, goes to Pittsburgh. I mean, he's been playing the I don't know where I'm playing next year game since 2020. And that opportunity to sign a multi-year deal and at least have that feeling of, okay, I know where I'm going to be. I don't have to think about, you know, my contract value for, for agency the future year, where I'm going to play. And I don't know if he's got a family in terms of, you know, moving those guys around, all that kind of stuff. But there's certainly value in that. And so those are one of those kind of things that, we don't think about a lot when we talk about players and where they're going to sign. We think about money, think about, you know, opportunity, got to think about some of that security and stability. Ogan Joby's not had a lot of that in recent years. And so I think that's a big driving reason why he, you know, stayed in Pittsburgh. And of course they, they paid him pretty well too. Right. Plus he under, you know, he, he's got a, a firmer grasp of what, you know, uh, what they're expecting out of him. scheme, who, he, who, you know, who, who he's lining up, uh, uh, with, you know, or, or, you know, mostly with, you know, obviously with Cameron Hayward and, you know, the, the, the edge guys and those kind of things. So the familiarity factor will be stronger, but yeah, I think he's a guy to circle that man, if this thing goes off the rails on a defensive line, you know, he, 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 he's, they need him in there and they, and mm -hmm. I'll, I'll just go back to saying once again, uh, look, I mean, what are, what are the odds of him putting up a season like he did two seasons ago? Probably uh, that, that might be asking a little bit much, but the closer that he can come to, to that season before he had that injury late, late in the season, a couple of years ago, that, that would obviously be ideal for him. 
not that we want to be beholden to any one number, but what would you say from a sack perspective would make for a successful season for Larry Ogunjobi, just one and a half last year? How many are you hoping and expecting he gets in 2023? Yeah, the first number is it jumped. The first number that jumps in my head is five. Mine too. Uh, now, obviously, you know, uh, I, I would sacrifice a, 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 a sack or two if, man, this guy just, you know, was constantly providing pressure uh, because that along with the, if the rest of your, 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 your defensive front stays healthy, somebody's going to eat off of that, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, for sure. But, uh, uh, just from a raw statistical standpoint, five jumps, jumps into my head. I mean, if he can hit, hit five, six, seven sacks, things of probably a lot of those guys, uh, are, are, are seeing strong sack numbers or pressure rates. Sure. I want to chart the course to get back to the 50 sack seasons Pittsburgh was having and probably would have still had last year at TJ Watt stayed healthy. They finished last year, I believe, around 40, getting a bunch of those in that finale on Deshaun Watson in Cleveland. Um, but yeah, again, not that, you know, one sack number is the end all be all that says how a season goes. But I think five is a, a good number. To hit. What about Liao? Let's play the game of Liao sack number. I think, you know, where he's at. He might be more of a pressure guy than a sack guy to start out with, but he's got to find some pass rush production because it was not there as a rookie. Yeah. And I think that's how you start making up some of those, uh, getting back to 50, right? Uh, the number, the number two and a half to three, uh, jumps in my head. Okay. Yeah. I was thinking about three. I think that's fair, but I, he, you know, again, really good athlete. I saw there was a clip that somebody I, I'd come across on Twitter about two weeks ago, him in high school doing backflips, like just a ridiculous athlete. But can, can that translate into being a successful pass rusher? They're two different things. And again, you know, tough rookie year. Remember he got hurt too. People forget about it. He was on IR. He had a meniscus mm-hmm. injury and I think surgery. So that you know, he had a lot of setbacks and roadblocks and position changes. So I get all that, but you know, it's a big year too for him. And again, hopefully Pittsburgh has a defined role and plan for him. Um, really good athlete. I think he's got a lot of pass rush moves, but a plan and what's your go-to move and how you're setting up moves, all the things he has to work on. All right. And uh bitten uh, uh, media session, I think was a little bit shorter there, but you know, that's really kind of, it feels like the first kind of real, uh, a little bit more extended audio that we've had of him since I think he was drafted uh, overall. I think there've been clips and all here and there, but uh, uh, my takeaway from, from that is, is he, he sounds like a sharp dude first and foremost. And uh, obviously talked about, you know, the, fam- you know, a lot, you know, he's not dealing with so many of the unknowns from the, Oh, I'm going to a new team. I'm not going to know anybody he mentioned, you know, already knowing guys on a team with, you know, obviously with some, some uh, Wisconsin uh, roots and all like that. So uh, he seems real comfortable. Uh, he comments about Ogan Joby about, uh, and, and look, it, it's typical kind of rookie talk, right? I got to earn the, the veterans respect and says Ogan Joby really doesn't say too much, uh, but it seems like those two might be warming up uh, a, a little bit there. And, and more than anything, he's learning, process and how to practice and how to practice like a professional. And that's the kind of things this time of year, I think that, 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 that you feel good about hearing there, but I, my, my general uh, overall takeaway from Benton talking was more so of one of, he sounds like a really sharp kid. Yeah, when I spoke to him at the Senior Bowl, I think he was confident and, you know, humble, but pretty sure of himself. And he talked about how Pittsburgh was the perfect place for him to go. And I think the feeling's mutual. I think getting Benton was the perfect guy to go after because we've talked about this before, that the the, the projection is easier. It's cleaner when you take those Wisconsin guys. It's no coincidence that the most uh, players from any one school on this roster right now is Wisconsin with five, and they're all defensive guys. T.J. Watt, Isaiah Laudamo, Nick Herbig, uh, Keanu Benton, and Scott Nelson, the safety. And because Wisconsin's defense has been so similar to Pittsburgh, you know, even front, a lot of run stunts, aggressive, well-coached type of guys, they're pretty easy to project into your system. And so that's why I think Pittsburgh gravitates towards them a lot. And that's going to make the transition for Benton easier because, hey, as he said, 
He's got familiar faces around him, including literally a teammate last year in Herbig. The scheme, the system is similar in terms of just, you know, what they want to do conceptually, schematically. And so it's going to make that that learning curve a bit easier for for uh, Keanu Benton. If I remember correctly uh, on his tape, some of the uh, issues seem to be kind of more technical and some balance issues uh, at times. And if I also recall, his his better tape was closer to the center than it was him moving out. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think he was on the ground a little bit, probably popped up a little too high occasionally as well. The run defense was a little inconsistent, so I think he's got to anchor a bit better against those double teams. Um, yeah, I don't think he's, again, I mean, I, I know I, I talked about him so early in the process. It's not necessarily to say that I think he's going to be an all-star. I don't see Kim Hayward. I don't know if I even quite see Javon Hargrave, but I think I see a really solid player in the middle that's going to be probably more valuable to the team than the stats may show. Um, so I don't think he's going to be the second coming of this elite top defensive lineman. But I think in terms of what Pittsburgh needs, what they look for, I think he's their guy. Boy, what if they got another Hargrave out of him? <laughs> hey, you know? I'm all for and, that. And look, you hit, you hit on him, right? I mean, he was, I mean, he jumped out, you know, uh, at, at, at you right out of the shoot. I mean, we, you know, as soon as you hit that senior bowl tape, he, he was a guy that, that, that really stood, stood out and all. So, uh, yeah, the measurables too. I mean, the, the yeah. measurables made it easy. I mean, the dude, the dude has the prototypical size. Right. So, uh, good to hear from those two, uh, yesterday. Uh, Darnell Washington speaking as well. We've kind of heard from him, from him him a couple times already, though, but just talked about, you know, what I liked about him was he's not resting on his laurels and he's this big, you know, blocker type, but he talked about how he has to get better as a blocker too. And I like guys that are good at something, but know they can be even better at something. He discussed his footwork has to improve. He got to the NFL and said, you know, in college, what I did was not going to fly in the NFL. I got to be better. I got to improve my footwork. And, um, you know, I think that's just going to make him, all the better of a player. You know, if you didn't know he was a rookie and you listened to that interview uh, uh, from 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 Tuesday, you'd swear he'd been in the league a year or two. <laughs> Pittsburgh know? drafted a lot of mature guys. Right. I mean, they. I mean, even last year with Kenny Pickett, obviously, um, guys like Najee Harris, Pat Fryermuth. Yeah, they really drafted some some good dudes. I think he handles himself really well, man. And he's he's just. I mean, he's a man child. He's a, he's a grown man. <laughs> uh, and it is going to be, and look, I mean, his, his, you know, we know how good his blocking was, uh, you know, the last couple of years at, at, at Georgia there and you are know, already seeing some clips with him, <laughs> uh, Fred, the sleds, you know, mm-hmm. gonna, gonna be busy with him, uh, o- over the summer and really get a workout, uh, when it comes to that. But I mean, uh, to, to, to think that this guy, uh, knows that he can already make improvements in that that specific area alone, you know, because you talked about you know footwork and 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 those kind of things there, uh, you know, get you even more excited about him. And we haven't even hit on the uh, what he may or may not add uh, in 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 the passing game. And you know, he talked about you know uh, watching Fryermuth and those kind of things there. So. Uh, coming out of that interview, just an, an, another reason, I think, to get more excited about a young player. And and once again, th- this team's going to try to play, you know, bully ball. And you would think he's going to be on the field a lot in, 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 in two tight end situations there. And if that kid's blocking can get even better than it was coming out of his final season at Georgia, man, really get excited about that. Sure. And I do think, well, I think. He was a really good blocker coming out. There was work to be done. I think he did lunge a bit too much. I think he kind of was over his toes. And those are some of the footwork things he's got to improve upon. And so it's good to hear him recognize that. And again, I think Alfredo Roberts is a really good coach, a longtime coach in the NFL, Super Bowl winner. And he's coached up Frymouth and Zach Gentry as a blocker in 2021 and Connor Hayward last year. I think Washington's in good hands with Alfredo Roberts. All right. Anything else stick out from Washington that, that, that he had to say? No, I think that covers it. One uh, comment that Anthony McFarland made, and this was off of Steelers.com. There was no video of the comments, but he talked about, and it's, I mean, it, it's a very self-aware statement that he's got to make this team through special teams. And I think it's a really interesting comment because 
I agree with that to be the number three running back, which is wide open right now behind Najee Harris, behind Jalen Warren. But how is he going to make it? Because right now his value seems to be minor kick return value, and I'm not sure what else. So it's going to be a really important year for him to, to prove it to Danny Smith that he can make this team. Well, look, we've talked about him in special teams now for a couple of years now, and uh, that's, you know, the, the, he, he knows it and he's probably has known it for, for a while now. Uh, the bad thing about him, and I think as a video that you had last year, that special teams works probably not going to come as a gunner or a jammer. Uh, yeah, they tried him. It <laughs> didn't work too well. Uh, probably not going to be a guy running down, covering kickoffs either. Uh, uh, that kind of thing. So, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be in a return game uh, with him. And there's going to be several guys once, once you get to training camp that are going to be in those long lines of, of, of getting chances. And he was the one that did, did he, did he, what was the, he dabbled in one of the two in college. Was it kick returns or was it punt return or was it both that he just barely dabbled in? I think it was more kicks. I can look up. What I'm trying to did. remember what he did more of. Let me uh, check here. I think, I think he, had one, he has one career kick return for 40 yards. Okay, yeah. th that's what it was. And a handful of punts, right? Uh, it says zero punts. Okay, all right. So uh, not very accomplished at all. It was just the fact that he did at least do it once overall. So it's not like he's got a resume from college in a return game to lean heavily on. So that's another, right. that's another strike. I mean, he really is going to have to flash uh, in that area because once again, he's not a bigger, a bigger back. So, you know, you, you can't envision him being on special teams other than with the football in his hands. Right. But I mean, the number three back last year was Benny Snell, who was a core four phase guy that did it all without returning stuff. Obviously, Jalen Warren, you know, how much is he going to run down kicks this year? He may be some, but they probably want to make sure he's focused on on being healthy and, you know, being available to, to be a running back because his role is going to increase there this year. Um, so you better find guys that can do more than just occasionally return kicks and probably be the backup kick returner, which is essentially, you know, minimal type value. So McFarland's going to have to do some of that stuff in terms of running down kicks and maybe he tries again at gunner, but you look at Alfonso Graham, he was a gunner in college. And so he's got a background there that might give him a leg up. I just talked about Darius Hagan's at 13 special teams tackle or 13 total tackles. I think most of them came on special teams in his career at Virginia state. And so those are rookies that have a better resume, have a better background there. That's going to really push McFarland. Yeah, so it's going to be a hard road to him, right? A hard road for him, right? And you know, as as we sit the way the ninety man roster sits right now, you'd have to view him as an outside the bubble kind of guy. I do, but I don't know who's inside the bubble for that number three running back spot. I don't know right. if there any guy on the roster is right now. They're probably all kind of on the bubble, jockeying A with each other and B with the field. Any potential outside guy, that may be, be, be a position where you get a waiver claim that you add right before the season starts as that number three. I think one guy that's a free agent right now that makes sense is Malcolm Brown. He's got some size that Pittsburgh likes and playing special teams. He's, um, you know, can run the ball a little bit. I think he's kind of a number three type. And of course, you know, Benny Snell, if he wants to come back, I'm good with that as well. All right. Uh, anything else from any of the uh, Tuesday offerings? I think that covered it pretty well. We'll see what Wednesday has. Uh, one of the Tuesday offerings did not come from a Steelers player, but from a media personality, Colin Coward. It seems like a yearly thing because just about one year ago, he made the same comment about Minka Fitzpatrick and the Pittsburgh Steelers. Yesterday's comments were more about Buffalo, but he kind of folded Pittsburgh into it, criticizing the Bills for signing pass rusher Leonard Floyd, basically with the idea of saying that Defensive coaches do not have success in the NFL. They focus too much on spending money on defense, not on offense. You look at the teams that are the most successful in the NFL. Your, you know, Kansas City's, your Cincinnati's, Philadelphia's, all offensive-minded coaches that spend more heavily there. And again, folding Pittsburgh into, you know, spending too much on defense, not building their offensive line, et cetera, et cetera. So 
your thoughts on what Colin Coward had to say. Well, first and foremost, I mean, I don't know why, why you lump Mike Tomlin in spending in the same paragraph. Mike Tomlin doesn't control the spending on this team. I mean, he is a defensive minded coach, obviously, but I mean, he's been around long enough where he has hands in, in, in all of it, uh, at, at, at this point. So to kind of, uh, loosely put that narrative on Tomlin and attach spending to it, you know, he, he's, he's the coach, you know, the, the, you know, the, Omar Khan puts his team together, uh, from, from a financial standpoint. And here's the thing about financials. Do you, ha, do you, do you think, uh, uh, Colin Coward, uh, uh, can discern the difference between cash and cap? No, <laughs> I can confidently <laughs> say he probably cannot. All right. Well, I can. And, uh, after you wrote that up and, uh, you know, uh, I ended up talking a, a little bit about this on Dave, we, my week, my weekly interview with Dave weekly on the radio, uh, yesterday, because I had the numbers already kind of, uh, spreadsheeted up cause I wanted to look at things. And I figured we might talk about this today during the podcast here. Uh, first of all, let's go back to real quick, what the difference between cash and cap is a cap charge, uh, is, can, can, you know, is, is obviously related to a base salary, any prorated signing bonus, uh, if there's any roster bonuses or, or, or anything in there. That's how you determine a cap number. Uh, and I have had rants both on the site and on this podcast over the years about how during the offseason people want to measure rosters by what where they're spending money either positionally or or side of the ball when it cuz comes to cap number and all it takes is for one or two players for 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 things to change from let's say the end of May to the start of September for one one or two players that have high cap numbers to have their contracts restructure to reshape the whole rankings around the league when you look at that kind of stuff. So that's why it's silly for anybody to measure these things from a cap spending perspective, whether it be either a player individually, a group, a, a position group of players or a defensive or an offensive unit. The better way to always look at this is how much cash our team spending on a player or a position group or a side of the football here. And, 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 uh, cash is easily determined by a single player, uh, in a single year by looking at his base salary, which obviously could be restructured too, uh, at, through, throughout, uh, in off season, but you're going to get a better handle, uh, especially come the, 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 uh, the start of the regular season of a cash, accounting method for a player or a group of players by using the cash method. And when you look at this rock and here's the thing, you you, uh, cash, if you give a a player $8 million uh, and eight, let's say $8 million signing bonus in 2023 uh, and a base salary, let's just throw out a rough number of $1 million to keep it even out there, even though his, his cap number would be lower because of the signing bonus proration and all, you're still looking at a cash expenditure on that player, assuming that, you know, there's no roster bonus or anything like that. You're looking at a cash expenditure of $9 million. All right. So where, where am I going on, on all this? What I did is the way the roster looks right now on, well, it was actually yesterday, June, June the 6th. When you look at the top 10 players on both the offense and the defense when it comes to what this team has tied up in actual cash for 2023 on the offensive side of football your top 10 players account for 67 a little over 67.3 million dollars in cash conversely when you look at the top 10 cash expenditures on the defensive side of football at this present time you're looking at a little over $88.7 million. So you've got a difference there of, let's say, 
oh, what's that? Twenty one and a half million dollars. You're spending mm-hmm. more cash uh, on on defense in your top ten on that side of football versus the top ten on the offensive side of football. Now, uh, you can't. You, you got to talk about. So why why is the cash spending? on the, the defensive side of football higher in the top 10 on that side versus the top 10 on the offensive side. <laughs> you got TJ Watt and Minka Fitzpatrick, who I think at this point now, it TJ Watt number two uh, and it Minka number two positionally or uh, when it comes to edge and whatnot. I believe, I believe so. Yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously both in the top five o- overall, and I think both currently sit, sit top two uh, positionally uh, right now. And you had no choice but to, but to pay those players at the time w- what you gave them, you know, and, and to do the contracts the way the way that they were done. So uh, Watt and Fitzpatrick alone. Now, here's the thing. Watt's all, I mean, uh, Minka's already been restructured uh, this offseason. So to look at his cap hit, uh, it's actually a little, you know, it, it, you know, it, uh, that that was lowered earlier in this offseason. But you have to look at uh, because of that was given, a, 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 you know, uh, restructured in a way that he was given cash you know, as part of the signing bonus to to restructure his deal, his cash charge this year is still fourteen point five uh, million in two thousand twenty three, and TJ Watt currently sits at twenty million and will continue to sit at twenty million dollar cash expenditure even if his contract's restructured. The only thing that'll change is his cap number go down, right? right. So uh, you've got thirty four point five million dollars tied up in cash in those two players alone. You also uh, gave Larry Ogunjobi uh, a new deal this offseason, and that's resulted in a $12 million cash uh, expenditure for him uh, this year. Uh, so, I mean, just looking at Watt and Fitzpatrick alone lets you, and, and, and remembering that those two guys are two of the highest paid uh, players in the league at their positions respectively that that's caused the, you know, you know, that number to be at 88.7 million, a little over 88.7 million in cash when it comes to your top 10, uh, players. And look, we haven't even gotten to an Alex Highsmith is, is number 10 on this list of top 10 at 2.743 million. Well, if he gets a deal, you're going to spend more cash on him in mm-hmm. 2023 as well, too. Uh, conversely, when you look at the offensive side of football, you don't have a franchise quarterback under contract right now, right? So mm-hmm. uh, that, you know, uh, if you had a Ben Roethlisberger still on a roster, I can guarantee you the cash expenditure on the offense would be uh, uh, um, uh, much higher overall. So that's something to think about in this. Now, the argument, I guess, that 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 Colin Coward to swing this back to him would be is they should have spent more cash on the offensive side of football uh, this offseason. Uh, but, you know, they did go out and sign a guy like Isaac Sayamalo, $8.25 million in cash for him uh, this year. They signed uh, Nate Herbig. That's $4 million in cash this year. So if you wanted to make it argue or if 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 if, if Colin Coward wanted to better frame his argument, A, he would have talked in terms of cash first and foremost. And second, you know, I, I guess you could say, I guess you could argue, well, the Steelers should have spent, they should have signed another higher profile player this offseason. But but who would that player have been? And, and sure. what, what what position? And if they would have let, let's let's take tackle, for instance. Okay. Who, you know, and and you'd have to pull up a list of who the tackles were that got paid in free agency. Yeah, Orlando Brown, Jawan Taylor. Let's say Jawan Taylor, because he's more right tackle. Okay. Uh, all right. If he's a right tackle, then then what are you doing with a core for? You know, you would have. Mm-hmm. And, and as I wrote earlier in the off season, uh, because of his where his uh, roster bonus was due, you would have had to made a decision on him back in March. Right. So you would have swapped really the the cash expenditure that you have for a core for this year is ten million. So that would have gone away. <laughs> True. 
Oh, right? you could say, I mean, they showed all interest in Orlando Brown Jr. You could argue uh, just mentioning some of the top tackle names. All right. So had you gone that route and spent that money, well, then you wouldn't have probably spent a first round draft pick on Broderick Jones, right? Right. So all of this has a kind of a, you know, a reactionary snowball uh, uh, effect on it. You know, really the only thing I guess you could probably say if you want to prop up the uh, Colin Coward side of the argument more would have been, you know, the, the only way to, to have this thing hold water with him would, would be, I think, to say, well, the Steelers should have gone out and signed a high profile, expensive wide receiver. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what name that would have been in I a pretty I, weak, weak right. free agent class. Right. So, A, who who would that a player have been? I mean, that that's the only way to kind of equal up this money a little bit, right? Because if you, if you do a right tackle, then a core four is probably out the door back in March. You're probably not – it, it impacts – the draft that way you're not going to go out and sign a franchise quarterback right sure. uh i mean and and look even in this top 10 offensive money of cash spent anyway mitch trubisky right now is fifth on the list at eight million dollars well he was going to be fifth on the list anyway uh prior to the extension because he was set to earn what eight million dollars mm -hmm. it's just it's just the, the result of the extension ended up being cap related um, more so than, than than cash because he's already scheduled to earn eight million. He's still earning eight million dollars in you know after this extension. It's just all you did was add two years onto his contract and lowered his cap number uh, w w within that. So uh, I would like this side of the. I would like to hear Colin Coward answer to everything that I put out there because I, I don't know logically how you can have this narrative other than having not paid TJ Watt, having not paid Mika Fitzpatrick right? yet going out there. The only way to help bump up the cash side on the offensive side of the football in my mind would have been to come right out and say the Steelers should have went out and, signed a high high or traded for a high priced wide receiver. Sure. And I think his point about Pittsburgh is a bit broader than just this year, but just kind of the general track and trend that they're on. Here's what I think Coward got wrong. Here's what I think Coward got right. What I think he got wrong as you, you know, thoroughly pointed out was this very narrow viewpoint of using cap to determine, you know, how you're spending your money, how it relates to cash. And I think even more specifically, you know, you you drafted a bunch of rookies on the offensive offensive side of the football, so their 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 cap numbers are lower because they're on rookie contracts. They've really invested heavily in offense the last, I would say, three draft classes with Kenny Pickett, Najee Harris, Pat Frymuth. Uh, you get Broderick Jones this year, uh, George Pickens, etc. And so eventually those guys will get paid, and they're they're gonna you know tip the scales more in the offense's favor on the on the cap aspect side of things the way the defense has because you drafted all those guys you know a while back, and they're all getting paid now. So I think it's a pretty narrow and probably, you know, wrong way to, to look at it from coward standpoint. What I think the point that he makes that, that resonates with me is less about that in, in the cap aspect, but just the idea that, you know, offenses win Super Bowls and they're the teams that are the most competitive and you don't have a top tier, you know, super potent, high quality offense. It's going to be hard to win. And I think for Pittsburgh, you know, I think what I'm, talked about before is they're, build, they're building this team to be competitive, to be in the playoff hunt, to be a solid high floor type of team. The question is how, how high their ceiling is going to be. And can they ever beat these elite top tier quarterbacks? Unless Kenny Pickett becomes one of those guys, it may be a tough road to have. It may be where you're a Tennessee Titans team where you're in the mix, you're in the hunt, you're competitive, um, but you're getting bounced in round one or maybe making it to the divisional round. So I understand Coward's point from that aspect that the teams that do have the most success overall have typically been offensively driven, offensive minded head coaches, and and they've gotten really good results from that. You know, uh, and and another thing is you got to look at this too when you're talking about cash. You got to you got to look at it in three year increments as well too because that's the way 
the NFLPA and the, the league looks at it as well, too. So uh, if you want to look back on this in, uh, over a three-year period and say the Steelers have spent a lot more cash over a three, and I don't have, I, you know, there's something to play with here at once we get past uh, mandatory mini camp when I have time to sort and, you know, uh, dig dig deeper into this and all. But I mean, if you want to look over, uh, and this is obviously the, the 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 third year of the three year period, we've talked about that several times as far as the uh, looking at the outlook at what maybe a guy like Alex Highsmith is going to get paid and, and, and that kind of stuff there. But I mean, if you do want to look at it, over a three-year period of time, uh, has this team spent more money in cash on defense than it has on offense? Well, I, you, you know, you got uh, once again within there too. Uh, uh, when when was the Hayward? When was the last Hayward deal? Uh, was that uh, 20, like actual 20? contract or restructure? Uh, no, the the last Hayward signing wasn't that in two thousand twenty one. With, with uh, was it 2020, 2021, right around there. Let me uh, look let here me real see. quick. Uh, 2020. No, that was 2020. So uh, it wasn't like that. There was that, I mean, because the signing bonus would play into cash in that that year. But uh, even so, uh, when you're looking at, you know, obviously TJ Watt and 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 and, and Minka were, were paid in this three-year cycle. And this team did go out and spend $6 million this offseason in cash on, on Cole Holcomb. Uh, Landon Roberts currently sits in the uh, top 10 in cash for 2023 because they got 35, uh, 3.5 million uh, tied up in him. Uh, who Patrick else? Peterson, where does he fall into to that? Uh, list? Peterson, yeah, look, you got $7.15 million in cash tied up in Peterson uh, this offseason there. So. Uh- Again, obviously, I think Coward's conflating cash versus cap does not have a grasp of what all that means. But to the larger point, which is basically, in his view, that defensive minded coaches focus too much on defense. And if the offensive juggernauts win the day, it's not the old defense win championships adage anymore. Do you do you get that point? Do you agree with that point? What do you make of kind of maybe the bigger picture argument that Coward's making? Well, let, let me add this on top of this, though, too. When you talk about cash spending and free agency, the Steelers are just not th- that kind of team that participates heavily in high-end free agents, first and foremost, right? Yeah, that's never been their model. It's always they, been the draft developer team. They built through the draft. So if you want to boil all this down, uh, to its core of maybe an, an, an argument, maybe the Steelers got to do a better job of drafting on the offensive side of football. <laughs> sure, they flip back. I mean, there was that, what, seven straight years drafting a defensive player in the first round. And I think that is maybe, the, again, the bigger picture of Coward's point where it's been too defensive focused, not focusing enough on creating offensive firepower that can go toe for toe with some of these, you know, most potent offensive units in football. I think that that's the main point to really evaluate here. Oh, okay. But if you go back, uh, 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 to last year, I mean, uh, or, or yeah, I mean, obviously Kenny Pickett was a first round draft pick in, in 2022, right? Uh, your first round draft pick, uh, this year was obviously, uh, an, an, an offensive tackle. You go back to 2020, 21, uh, what'd you, what side of the ball did you dedicate your your draft picks to in 2021? Sure, offensively, I, I just mentioned all that about where I think again the the issue with looking so focused uh, on on the cap aspect is it ignores the rookie contracts that aren't going right. to necessarily keep the carry those those high cap charges, and you've drafted a bunch of those guys, and eventually they'll get paid, and it's going to increase the offensive cap number. So again, I think I think that's where Coward is getting some of the wrong view in in, in, in the specifics of it, but. To be fair, I mean, Pittsburgh is not trying to build an offensive juggernaut. They're trying to build that bully ball, you know, ball control, run the ball. We're not going to score 30 points a game, but we're going to try to prevent you from scoring 30 points a game. And I think Coward's point is that model is not going to work to actually win Super Bowls. Okay, uh, and and that's the large, larger question that you just asked me is, is does defense still win championships? Essentially, Basically. yes. Yes. Uh, I, I'll, I'll boil it down to this. If, if I had my druthers uh, of having a, a better defensive adjusted net yards per passing attempt stat or a better offensive 
net yards for passing attempt number, which one would I, would I rather have? Well, uh, yeah. If you could tell me that my defensive number is under six, I'll take whatever number you give me. If I can have that offensive number over seven or higher, I think. I don't know if that answers the question of this defense win championships or not. Not, uh, it's not enough. Right. Right. And I think to his point, again, who's been winning Super Bowls lately, offensive coaches. And and to be fair, there are just simply more offensive coaches in the NFL. There are only a handful of defensive guys. But um, if you look at the defensive coaches, Coward's point was those guys have not had a lot of success in the playoffs, whether it's Mike Tomlin in recent years. I mean, obviously, he's won Super Bowls, but we're talking more recent, this new age type of stuff, whether it's um, I think, you know, I mentioned Sean McDermott of the Bills, obviously um, the Chargers. I mean, those types of teams have not gotten as far as they would like to look and and and, uh, i understand why they're going to play bully ball uh you know uh at least in the current right now and they know that they're that's how they're going to be able to win some games by controlling the football that way and but uh, you know the the bigger picture is at some point and we've talked about this is they're going to have to be more explosive. They're going to have to put more points up on the board. And I don't think you can put more points up on the board without having that explosive aspect to it, without being able to throw the football uh, to, 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 to some degree. Yeah. Th- this team might be built this year to win some, some one score, lower scoring games. Right. But they're uh, they're not going, they're not going to be able to compete for another championship and this is where we get paid for the big bucks here is, is uh, where people tune in for the analysis is they're going to have to score more points. Mm-hmm. Uh, sure. If you want to boil it down that way as an argument to say, look, plain and simple. If I'm uh, let me give me my best Colin coward uh, I- I- imitation here, plain and simple pause. Yeah. Very long. A lot of pregnant uh, pauses with Colin coward. Uh, the Steelers are not going to be able to compete for a Super Bowl championship until they start figuring out offensively how to score more points. <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> I like it. Um, I mean, yeah. I, and, and I mean, if, if that's yeah, that's his argument. I, that should be the that should have been the argument over the angle that he took. Right. I, I agree. I think he focuses again. He's too focused on the, on the cap number. He's just, I think, using that to illustrate the, the broader point. And, and again, you can counter that by saying Pittsburgh has invested heavily in this offense and we'll see what Kenny Pickett becomes. Obviously, they're in that transitional phase and they've loaded up on offense and the offensive line. The offense will be, should be, better be better in 2023. The question is, how much better will they really be this highly octane, potent offense? Probably not. And that's not really what they're even expecting or trying to build. And here's the thing about spending the money on defensive side of football. You've got to spend money on the, the CBA says you've got to spend money on something. And if you're, if it ends up that your best players wind up being on the defensive side of football, you got to pay those guys. Right. Yeah. And again, the, when, when they, when they signed Minka Fitzpatrick last year and Coward criticized the team, it was just like, it's the dumbest thing. Cause what are you going to do? Not sign Minka Fitzpatrick and expect to be a better team. Obviously, you know, that, that's ludicrous. So I think some of the individual aspects of it from Coward are, are really off base. I think the larger point he's making is probably a fair one and a concern that I have too. I mean, like, do you think putting Coward aside for a second, do you think the way Pittsburgh is building their team, which is good defense, ball control, run the ball effectively, win that lower scoring, tighter game, is that a model that can get this team a Lombardi trophy? And can they can they win number seven under this kind of general model that they're building currently? Uh, unless the, the defense looks something like it did <laughs> 2005 or eight or whatever. Uh, no, I, I, I don't. I share the same concern. I don't want to say there's no chance because you never know you get in the playoffs. Who knows what could happen? But I think it's a hard road to lead. And that is Coward's point, essentially. What, if, if you're building it, if, if you're looking at your response and saying, no, they, they probably won't win a Super Bowl with this model, then why are you building the model in this way? If, it, if it's probably not going to be the path to a Super Bowl. All right. How could they have built the model otherwise? It's a fair point. Um, whether that's, I mean, obviously, 
and, 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 and again, I'm not trying to argue it either side. I'm just trying to look at it from, from Coward's perspective of just adding, you know, probably not drafting a defensive player for seven straight years in the first round was probably going to be what Coward's argument is. And of course, does that mean do you pass on TJ Watt you know, and get into, into all those things? But, you know, going with the all in offensive model is what Coward is saying. And they didn't even draft Minka, right? I mean, they traded right. for him. So you right. can't put that. Uh, uh, that was just an ideal opportunity there. Uh, I guess the way I, you know, outside organizationally within the last three years, you know, I, I guess you could make the argument of, uh, you know, I, other than keeping, had they changed offensive coordinators this off season, how would that have impacted your thoughts on this offense being more high power? I mean, a, it would have it would have depended on who they brought in. Obviously, it, it, it would have been some of that growing pains to start. You went through last year with the new OC. That's probably another fair point too. I think if you're if you're a coward, you would sit there and say you've never really had a, a, a successful or kind of bigger name OC. Todd Haley was was the last one, and that's kind of the last time Pittsburgh had that potent offense. Which, granted, had as much to do with having Bell and AB and and Ben as it did the the OC. But I think coward's critique would be why you are hire, hiring these kind of you know, just blah, milk toast OCs and expecting your offense to win when you're competing against Andy Reid and, you know, Sean McVay when the Rams were good and all that kind of stuff. Like, why do you not have this super high end offensive coordinator, especially when your head coach is a defensive minded head coach? Could you could, could someone make another argument that they held on to Ben a, a year too long? Sure, you could. All uh, right. But uh, I, I guess I. How, you know, how do you reverse engineer this to over the last two years to make it better fit what Colin Coward at its root, at his root is trying to argue, I guess. Yeah, I, I don't know. There's so many different moving pieces within that, right. uh, you know, to, 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 to reverse engineer it. You know, and especially you would have to do things outside of what you've done anyway, which means going more into the high end free agency market outside. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's probably his point. I think his point is to, to change your whole philosophy and the way that you're going about things. So, again, I think it's not necessarily about the moves Pittsburgh has recently made, but just their overall philosophy, the way things have gone over the last several seasons is kind of, I, I guess, more of his critique. And I guess, too, it doesn't help within all that when you miss on first round picks like Bush. And uh, if you're not going offensive side of the ball like they did for a couple of those. Sure, they had they had some nice hits in there, you know, obviously, you know, Watt and uh, but. Uh, you did have some Terrell Edmonds in there. You did have some Bush. I'm, I'm obviously going back further than 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 a couple of years here. But if you're not invest, if you build through the draft and you you're 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 spending those picks on a defensive side of football when those guys don't hit at mm -hmm. all, in lieu of maybe an offensive side guy uh, uh, guy then that, that cripples an organization like the Steelers even more because of the philosophy that they have. And one of those offensive first-round picks was on a running back, which the new age people would say is the wrong approach to take with a first-round selection, and I think you agree with that sentiment as well. You talking to me? <laughs> <laughs> talking about some fungibility, yeah. So, again, I think to the larger point, I understand Coward's larger point. What I would say, and again, I kind of I'm kind of taking both sides here just to flesh out the argument is that you know I think Pittsburgh's model is not going to be enough to compete with the top end teams in the AFC and the top end quarterbacks. But to to your point, what other choice did you have? Because if you try to compete with Patrick Mahomes with the team that you have now and trying to build it that way, you're probably not going to win that way either. Pittsburgh's not going to win the shootout against you know a legendary first ballot Hall of Famer that Patrick Mahomes is going to be in an AFC that has so many loaded quarterbacks. So you might as well try to go counter, go the other direction and try something different um, than trying to, you know, beat Mahomes 40 to 37, because that's not going to work either. Look, unless you just are, 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 are oblivious and just playing fanboy aspect here, there's no way this team wins the Super Bowl this year, right? 
I mean, never say never, but, you know, I guess never is the, the Tomlin quote that I'll use here. I don't like to say it would I, be I, I, one hell of a damn sure. season if they do. And and a lot of kudos would go around to a lot of different areas if they do. Right. Pittsburgh's calculation is this. We're going to we, get we, grilled for this. You know, yeah, this is right? not going to go over well. Yeah, because A, we're talking that way. And B, we're, we're spending 30 minutes on Colin Coward. We're, uh, the listeners aren't going. This is not going to be a highly rated show. <laughs> Right. Again, I'm trying to peel away from Coward a bit because putting all that aside, just kind of the bigger picture about Pittsburgh's building this team. Pittsburgh's calculation, I mentioned this before, is A, we got to get back in the playoffs. We've not been in the playoffs enough recently. We've not won a playoff game since 2016. So that is step one. Before we talk Super Bowl, let's win a playoff game again. And I think Pittsburgh is building a team that certainly can compete and will consistently compete for the playoffs and will be in the mix this year. And if they make the playoffs, it would certainly not be a shock to me one bit. And so their thought is get in the dance first, give yourself a chance and we'll see what happens. Cause you never, you never know. They were 16 in 2005. Right. I mean, they, they, they were, things they were, happen. They were a bad team throughout most of that year in 05. They get on a hot streak late. They get in, they win with defense run game, different model today, but you know, they've had that history in their DNA and you get in the dance. You never know what could happen. You get in a game. Mahomes gets hurt. You know, that happened against Cleveland a couple of years ago. You never know. And so Pittsburgh's philosophy is get in the dance. Give yourself as many chances to buy those lottery tickets and see what happens. I think that's Pittsburgh's approach to this whole thing. All right. What's uh, let, let's fast. Let's move this. I know people are probably jumping out of their cars right now. What, what <laughs> not and screaming, get, 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 get off of it now. Uh, what is the narrative look like at this team? Okay. Let, let's say they get into playoffs, but they don't want a playoff game or worse. They don't even get into playoffs. Yeah, I don't know what the narrative is. It's what, probably just what is it going? What is going to be the? I mean, you know, obviously, you know, uh, Canada is not going to be in the future, right? So I mean, that'll that'll be an instant gratification uh, aspect for for the for the fans. But I mean, they're still at a score. Your your team is your team, and where and where are they going to spend the cash at on offense next year? You can't. It's too early for for a Kenny Pickett extension. Uh, Najee probably not going to get an extension. You you know, probably a fit, you hope a fifth year option, right? Uh, to help bump up the cash expenditure there. Maybe Pat Fryermuth. Uh, really, when it when it when you look at things right now, isn't Pat Fryermuth really the only only player on this team? Really, maybe that that's potentially looking at an extension next off season. I mean, Najee Harris will get the fifth year option if he has a good year. And so that'll be cash paid to him, not an extension form, but it'll be a, a boost in salary, obviously. Right. Right. Um, and fire goes, mood, but where, where else yeah. does, where else does the cash expenditure come from? They go, to, it goes to, to avoid, to avoid this argument next, <laughs> you know, uh, a rubber stamp next year. Yeah, which seems like it's going to happen because we had this this conversation a year ago. Um, it, it'd be an external uh, a wide receiver. They probably go sign something like that. But that would be really outside of what the organization does, right? To an extent, although I mean they've been you know not that they're spending hundred million dollar contracts, but they've spent money each of the last two off seasons. I mean they've they they've added. Well, people. They, they 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 well they here's the thing they they here's the thing when you want to get back into cash argument. Uh, once again, over a three year span, teams have to spend 90 percent uh, of the cap over the three over a three year span in cash. They have to. All right. The Steelers over this three year period, when all the inks dry come the first week of this season for the three year period, I project to be right at, if not even slightly higher than 100 percent of the cap in cash. So they're spending the money. Sure. No one's disputing that. Well, I mean, maybe Coward is, but I think Coward's saying it's, A, it's being allocated incorrectly. Okay. Um, I, I, again, I'm, still I, I trying, like, I'm still trying to, 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 to what way would he have liked to have seen this go other than changing organizational philosophies? Well, that's his point. That, I think okay. that's what his point is. I think he says Pittsburgh has a philosophy that is not going to lead to a Super Bowl trophy okay but, but even rewinding back to this offseason i i struggle to find out where that money would have been spent unless it would have been on a left tackle specifically like orlando brown or uh or a wide receiver which i'm, I'm even struggling to think who that would have been mm -hmm. you know i think it's less about 
an individual season in the collective totality of the last five, six years, I think is, and I'm not trying to make the point for him. I disagree with some of the things that he had to say, but I think it's less about this year and just more about the totality and the philosophy, which drives what you've done for the last five plus years. Look at this team in the next two years. I mean, they, they better be able to make a Super Bowl run in 2024 in some way, shape or form. Right. What does that look like? I mean, is that <laughs> getting to an AFC title game? And that's what a Super Bowl run, I think, means. I, if you don't I, get to there, then you didn't make a run. Right, right. So can they do that with the way they're currently built? We're kind of saying, yeah, it's it going to take a feel, lot to get there. It doesn't feel like it, but I right. mean, seasons change, you know? Sure. And if Kenny Pickett makes a big jump, I think he'll make a jump. I mean, we'll, Again, I think Kenny Pickett kind of defines how the season goes, despite all the other improvements and, and roster shakeups that Omar Khan has made the success or failure of the season comes down to how much of a jump Kenny Pickett makes because yes, Kenny Pickett could make no jump or a small jump and this team could still be nine and eight and maybe sneak into that wild card spot, but they're not going to, they're going to get bounced, you know, in, in round one. And so really where are you at? You're not anywhere new organizationally. You're in the same place you've been in for the last three, four, five seasons. And it's not really changing that too much. So Pickett's got to be the guy that elevates in a AFC North AFC that has so many great quarterbacks. I know it sounds defeatist at that, at this point, but it really, it really feels like getting to the playoffs and winning a playoff game would be a huge, uh, I, I would deem successful season. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. Because again, win a playoff game, that thing, that that uh, monkey on your back that you've had since 2017, last time you won a playoff game was 2016. You've had a lot of painful losses along the way. So that's how I would define a successful 2023 season. I'm, I'm, I'm with you there. I mean, for, a, for and, and Colin Coward, once again, didn't spend, I mean, we're getting all this out of like two two paragraphs, right? <laughs> if, if that, yes. but I, I understand kind of what he was saying he just said it wrong and it took us i guess and he would have probably had to dedicate 35 minutes to it like we did to say it right so but anyway it's 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 definitely a topical subject yeah i know we dwelled on it a lot um but again focus if you hate coward and i'm not saying i'm a big fan of colin coward um Putting that aside, just a larger picture is Pittsburgh building this team the right way to compete for a Super Bowl. There's a really good debate and discussion to be had about Pittsburgh's approach. There are reasons to, to support it. There's reasons against it. It is not easy to do. And what what is important, I think, at the least, and I'll close out just saying this, is that at least Pittsburgh has an identity and a plan. I don't think that really was there offensively the last couple seasons. This year, Pittsburgh really knows who they want to be, how they want to win. Will they do it? We'll wait and see, but at least they have a plan and a vision, and that's that's foundational stuff that every team must have. And look, I, I'll boil it down this way: I think for this team to start succeeding at the level that you know the organization is expected to 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 exceed at, uh, it has to have been through good drafts, and hopefully they had one this year. I'm with you, and I'm I'm hopeful that they did because I like their draft class overall. Right. All right, Dave. I think we. Spent a lot of a lot of time on that. I, I took it down the rabbit hole there. So, so I, I did too. I mean, but I, I wanted to affirm up, you know, uh, differences in cash and cap and why there is the balance that they have right now and potentially look at what what may or may not have could have been done to better at least satisfy his argument from the spending aspect of the the the, the, the two sides of the football. Yeah, I think Colin Coward's the guy that somehow did the math problem totally wrong, but arrived at the right answer. And just like, I don't know how you got there with like some really faulty reasoning and, and you know, steps along the way. Because again, I think his cash versus cap, I think he's totally just totally narrow minded on on that that kind of stuff. But I think his overall conclusion has some validity to it. All right. If you're still listening and made it this far, we apologize. And we <laughs> and we thank you for making it this far. And you are entitled to financial compensation. So consult a, a local attorney. All right, Dave, let's get to some reading emails and close out today's show. Yeah, let's see here. Uh, this is Mark Miller recent. And I think we already answered this, Mark. Uh, you resent it to me again. Yeah, I think you got to go back a couple of shows here. It's the one about 
Uh, can you give a brief explanation of what is the benefit of a player for agreeing to a contract restructure? Are there any negative aspects uh, for them? Mark, I, you know, we, we've already run way too long and talked cash and cap and all like that. So I don't want to rehash any of that, but I, I'm pretty sure, Mark, if you go back a couple of shows, you sit this on uh, the 7th of May. So uh, I would imagine right around in there is when we, I, I know we talked about that, Mark. So I'm not going to rehash that, that all again. I apologize. Uh, Mario writes in, gentlemen, any idea if the NFL compensates the XFL in any way for players who leave the league for NFL squads? These players are more valuable to the XFL than the NFL. So they've plucked from XFL rosters. It strips the league of the faces of the, the faces of their league, and it does so every year. I don't think that's a sustainable model from the XFL's perspective. Is there anything in place to address this incongruence? Boy, I don't even know what incongruence. You're using big words for me, uh, 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 Mario. Uh, first and foremost, I, I haven't really delved too much into XFL or USFL financials and contracts and 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 model. I, I believe it's pretty much just one year contracts with those guys, though, isn't it? I don't know for sure. I just know they have outs. The players can go to the NFL by a certain date. I think for this year, it's like December, mid December. You can get out of your contract immediately okay. if an NFL team signs you. I don't know in terms of length of contracts. Yeah, it's a fair point overall. But if you're the XFL, like. What 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 other alternative do you, do you have? You can't right. you can't sign these guys and say you can't go to the NFL because no one's going to sign with you in the first place or be hesitant right. to do so because they're they're locked in. So you're going to have to just kind of live with that. Yeah, the uh, both all of these leagues are at the mercy of what they what uh, of the NFL uh, o- overall. Here here's the big thing when it comes to those leagues right now. I, I watched a little bit of that uh, game uh, the other day. I think New Orleans or who was it? Uh, uh, I think it was a New Orleans game, man. Where are the fans? There were no fans there, <laughs> you know. Uh, how, you know, and, and look, I understand the Battle Hawks did what they did, uh, in the XFL, and that's because you know, the, 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 the obviously a former NFL franchise was there, and those, those people were just starved, I think, for, for football. There, you better a get these franchises in more starved locations for star. If they don't start putting fans in the seats, the, the, the TV, the, the, the TV revenue at some points, just, I don't think going to, going to be enough uh, when it comes to that. And that even got me thinking even more. Do you think there would be more interest in these leagues? If players, if it were more minor league, like almost like the old uh, uh, world league was right. Where you knew certain play, certain players for certain team for, for these teams had ties to uh, to an NFL organization. Like NFL Europe. Yeah. Yeah. Or- like NFL Europe. I okay. mean, uh, okay. uh, within that, because that would give more incentive to even, Steelers Depot to follow and report on these guys and do film mm-hmm. rooms. If we knew that they had direct ties to the Steelers organization, is this maybe, is there something within that the way NFL Europe was where they could a expand, I guess, the NFL rosters. To, in other words, allocate these players to these developmental leagues. Would that create in and of itself more interest in in the league overall i think it would i think it could a a, let me answer the the question that was originally asked i don't believe the nfl gives any sort of of compensation to the xfl players league i don't think there's any sort of actual direct compensation there's kind of a bit of a partnership between the two leagues and that's kind of where the xfl probably can sustain to answer your question yes i think there would be more interest but two problems with that a the NFL is not going to foot that bill because financially having that feeder league is such a drain on you because it's kind of a you're going to run that out. You're not going to make a profit off that. You're going to run that at a loss. And the NFL does not want to do that. B, do you have to create 32 XFL teams then for each team to have their own minor league? Club? No, no, I, no, I think you just, you know, uh, guys get allocated, you know, uh, now it would have to be some fairness, competitive balance fairness where, you know, you're not allocating all your good play. All the good players don't get on one team of some sort, but I'm not, I guess you would expose, uh, 
I don't know, at the end of the year, you, you sign X amount of future guys deals or something like that. And, uh, those guys would be relegated to some sort of XFL or USFL draft every year or something along those lines. I know? think I, I was thinking about a draft. I think if you had an XFL, cause like, just take the old supplemental draft, which doesn't exist anymore, essentially, and turn that into the XFL draft. That could drum up some interest. But unless you had a real clear link between, like, this is, if I'm a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, this is the the minor league team that I want to pay attention to because this is where the, the XFL guys will come from. It's going to be hard to create that link in that kind of incentive for, for a fan to go check out that XFL team. Hmm. If, it's a, if it's a draft, then there's not really a a feeder system. Cause you're, I assume you're drafting from the entire pool of what the XFL ha- has to offer. All right. It was just something that was running, uh, because yeah. I mean, look, we, we would probably do, uh, pay more attention just on, on, on the side alone. Right. If, if, sure. if they had ties, direct how ties, did, how did NFL Europe work? How many teams were there? Was there a, an NFL Europe team for each NFL club? I, was, were there that many NFL Europe organizations back then i don't i don't think it was that that expansive and i i i if memory serves me i think there were players from different nfl teams on on you know for, from one team on maybe multiple teams if, if memory served i don't remember specifically okay. yeah i'm just trying to think of back how to in, in the in nfl europe bolded just for financial reasons i'm guessing that just wasn't enough interest to make it work oh, economically I, yeah, I mean it's all about the money, right? <laughs> right. That's why most of these leagues fold. It's just financial stuff. So I mean, we went down another rabbit hole. We, we <laughs> we've gone Colin Coward, Colin Coward, and XFL and USFL have dominated uh, this show. But I mean, it's just this time of the off season and all like that. We had a but, good first uh, forty minutes. And yeah, we had a good we'll, run. We'll have that. Yeah, it was it was a good run, Alex. Uh, <laughs> you too. Let's Dave. see. Uh, I think we've got caught up on, on the questions here. Plus we're about an hour and a half in now, so it's time to wrap this up. So anyway, uh, if you're still listening, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Steeders Depot, follow Alex on Twitter at Alex underscore Kazora, follow the show at terrible podcast, email the show, the terrible podcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and want to donate to the cause, go to Steeders Depot.com, hit the donate button up right navigational bar. Also, if you like an ad free version of the site, Steeders Depot.com, hit the ad free button up right navigational bar. Uh, Hopefully we'll have a few different things to talk about uh, come Friday. Look, if you want to chime in on anything that we talked about today in, 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 you know, the, the, the Steeders model or, you know, anything kind of related to that long drawn out, you know, conversation about cash and spending and, and organizational, you know, let us know via email, the terrible podcast at gmail.com. So uh, until Friday, as always, thanks for listening to the terrible podcast with Dave and Alex.